of August 2012. The sidewalks in Midtown Manhattan were swarming with the morning rush of office workers and crowds of tourists were already pushing their way into one of the world's most famous tourist attractions, the Empire State Building. Around the corner, lurking behind a van, stood 58-year-old Jeffrey Johnson, wearing a suit and carrying a black canvas bag. Inside this bag was a semi-automatic handgun. When he spotted his target, Stephen Ercolino, he made his move. Pulling out the gun, he fired at Stephen five times. Put the gun away calmly and walked off, trying to blend into the crowd as his victim lay bleeding on the sidewalk. What you're looking at right now is video that was shot from Newscopter 7 earlier on this morning, probably about 10 or 15 minutes past 9 o'clock. Uh, if you're just joining us, I want to recap while NJ regroups. Uh, what, what you're seeing now are, are some shots from Newscopter 7 right after 9 o'clock, right around 9 o'clock actually. The call came in of shots fired right out in front of the Empire State Building. Uh, police and emergency crews and the FDNY tell us they were on scene within minutes. As you would imagine, there are a number of firehouses and, and, and the police are all over that area. So they responded very very quickly. What we have now that they've been able to sort out some of this is 10 people injured in this shooting. Doesn't mean all of them were shot. We know at least four people were shot. We're getting that from police. At least four people shot, 10 injured. As NJ so astutely points out, some of the people could have possibly been injured running away running away from this scene we're hearing from police that of the at least four people who were shot what, what did you just tell me in the in the 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 lower body and the legs area we still don't know how this went down but police do tell us they returned fire and hit who they believe was a gunman jeffrey johnson was born in japan in 1953 to an American father and Japanese mother. They moved to the United States when Jeffrey was 10 months old, and he grew up in Gainesville, Georgia. When Jeffrey was 11 in sixth grade, he was struck by a car and suffered severe head trauma that nearly killed him. He was in a coma for five days, and doctors did not expect him to live, but he ended up making a full recovery but he had to wear a helmet for a long period to protect his head from further injury. His mother stated, The doctors told me once that they would be very surprised if he didn't have any after effects, but he seemed to recover all the way. He was not acting funny, but you know, when you get older, your body, especially if you are injured, will kind of deteriorate. Jeffrey served in the United States Coast Guard from 1973 to 1977 and was honorably discharged with the rank of Petty Officer Second Class. Jeffrey had a love for comic books as a child and attended Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida from 1978 to 1980, leaving a year shy of the three years required for a certificate after which he started his own t-shirt design company called St. Jolly's Art. He was also married, but after four years, he and his wife ended up getting a divorce. In the mid-90s, he moved to New York for a fresh start and to be at the center of the art scene. He spent hours in museums and revered the Dutch painter Vermeer. He was also involved with a community of birdwatching photographers who were interested in hawks in Central Park. His snapshots regularly appeared on blogs tracking the birds in the area. Jeff would later find work at Hazan Importers in 2005, which was situated at 10 West 33rd Street as a women's apparel designer and lived alone in a walk-up apartment on Manhattan's Upper East Side with his cats, Romeo and Tiger. His building superintendent and neighbors described him as a quiet and polite man who was seen every morning wearing a suit and greeted his neighbors. 
he also had no known criminal record or history of psychiatric problems. He was a slight, meticulous artist. The first one to work in the morning, and the last one that would leave, without so much as a look outside for fresh air in between. A co-worker said the following about him. This guy was very eccentric. He was so detail-oriented. If he had a free minute, he would start doing origami. The things that came out of his mind were so original and creative. You knew that his mind didn't work the same way as normal people. But you worked with the guy so long that you just chalked it up to Jeff being Jeff. In this office, he worked shoulder to shoulder with 41-year-old Stephen Ercolino, a confident salesman used to getting what he wanted when he wanted. The artist chafed at what he saw as the salesman's casual bossiness, and the two never got along. In 2012, Stephen Ercolino was 41 years old. He was a 1992 graduate of the State University of New York at Oneonta. He lived with his girlfriend in Hoboken. He also started working for the same company in 2005 as a vice president for sales, having worked at the Batesh Group, which sold handbags and other products, and at the Jump Apparel Group. Stephen's brother, Paul, described him as a gregarious, outgoing family man who got along with just about anyone that he met. Years passed with both of these men working at Hazan, but no improvement was ever made in their relationship. The two brushed shoulders for years, often literally. Two large egos stuffed into a small office, and yet they could hardly have been less alike. The owner, Ralph Hazan, told co-workers that he thought that Jeff Johnson might be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Everyone in the office walked on eggshells around Jeff, except for Steve. If Steve needed something, rather than go to one of the owners, he'd go straight to Jeff, and Jeff wouldn't take any orders from him. Soon, their disagreements escalated. As time went by, you would walk down the hallway and see an elbow being thrown or a shoulder being shoved or even a nasty comment being made. Jeff was not slighted by the 5 foot 10, 220 pound rival, 6 or 7 inches taller than him and almost twice his weight. Steve was described as very laid back but Jeff was said to be the complete opposite regimented and stiff, and the two would continuously push each other's buttons. One of the co-founders of the company passed away in 2009, and by late 2010 and early 2011, with revenue falling, the company did some cost cutting. It was thought that Jeff could be easily replaced with a lower paid employee, and he was let go from the company. He seemed to take being laid off in stride and only asked to keep his computer, which the company allowed. He soon created a website for his t-shirt designs and posted intricate illustrations of cars, women and motorbikes as a way to make money. He remained fastidious in his apartment with his two cats and ran his vacuum early in the mornings, every single morning. No one looking at Jeff would know that he had lost his job. He put on a suit every morning, picked up his newspaper in front of his door, and walked two blocks to McDonald's for breakfast. Returning later in the day, and seemingly staying in his apartment on the third floor for the rest of the day. He would usually phone his mother every Sunday, but never told her that he had been laid off. Instead, he told her that he had quit because he did not get along with a co-worker. Months after he was let go, he returned to his old office building on April 27, 2011. Steve was leaving the elevator and Jeff was walking in. 
and Jeff decided to elbow Steve. Steve had finally had enough, so he grabbed Jeff by the throat and said, If you ever do anything like this again, I'm going to kill you. Both of them ended up going to the police, telling them that the other had threatened them. According to the police, the artist blamed the salesman for not selling enough of the items that he had designed on purpose and that was the reason that he was laid off. Steve and Jeff had filed harassment complaints against each other and it was also mentioned that Jeff had reportedly threatened to kill Steve before on several occasions. After the scuffle in April 2011, there is no reason to believe that they saw each other again. The weekly calls between Jeff and his mother would stop in January of 2012 when she asked if he needed any help with money and questioned how he could afford to live in New York City, which made him very angry and he told her that he should be the one taking care of them, not the other way around. After that, he sent her a two-page typed out letter on the 10th of January, which focused mainly on the death of Romeo, his cat. He had fretted so much over the cat's health that at one point Romeo's veterinarian expressed worry about him. At the time, the vet did not realize that Romeo was suffering from a rare and aggressive form of cancer, and Jeff spent months trying to save and treat the cat. And in his letter to his mom, he wrote that he had to let the cat go. He went on to detail about how the vet had euthanized the cat and stated that he had felt like such a moron and that the cat had been trying to tell him for years that something was wrong, but that he had not been able to help him. He told his mom that his life seemed dimmer since Romeo had died and that he would have honestly traded places with him. He ended the letter by saying, don't worry, I'm all right, Jeffrey. The last time she spoke to her son was on April 6, when he called her to wish her a happy birthday, and she knew then that he wasn't okay. On the 24th of August, 2012, Jeff emerged from his building at the usual time and in his usual attire and was seen by his building superintendent who he greeted and walked off setting about what the superintendent thought was his usual routine of going to buy mcdonald's and then later returning but what no one knew was that jeff was about to be evicted from his apartment due to non-payment and there was one specific person that he blamed for his financial struggles. Steve had just come back from a Mexican vacation with his girlfriend. He took the PATH train from Hoboken, New Jersey, where he lived, to the West 33rd Street building near the 5th Avenue where he worked. A co-worker saw him and shouted for him to wait. They then walked toward the entrance of the building together. They were almost there when the co-worker saw Jeff lurking behind a white van. She stated, he didn't say one word, he just had the look of death and evil on his face. At approximately 9.03 am, Jeff emerged from behind the van, pulled a 45 caliber semi-automatic handgun out of his coat pocket pointed it at Steve's head and fired one round. Once Steve fell to the ground, Jeff stood over him and fired at him four more times, killing him instantly. After the shooting, Jeff concealed the handgun in a briefcase he was carrying, while pedestrians in the vicinity of the site of the shooting screamed and panic. Jeff took advantage of this panic and tried to blend into the crowd. Jeff crossed the street and walked towards 5th Avenue. As construction workers standing on scaffolding outside the Empire State Building saw the whole thing from a different vantage point 
and yelled a warning. Guy in the grey suit, guy in the grey suit, he's the shooter. Jeff then turned on to 5th Avenue, staying close to the curb, threading his way around large flower pots. Two officers standing in front of the Empire State Building's West 33rd Street entrance were alerted by the construction workers' warnings and started approaching Jeff. As soon as he saw this, he took out his gun, but he did not fire off any bullets. The officers in turn, when he lifted his weapon, fired a total of 16 rounds, killing Jeff and injuring nine bystanders. People at the scene were shouting, get down, get down, and the gunfire lasted about 15 seconds. One officer fired seven times and the other nine times. The officer's bullet struck Jeff seven times. Three of the bystanders were directly hit by police gunfire, while the rest of the injuries were caused by fragments of ricocheting bullets or by debris from other objects hit by the police. Of those hit or grazed by bullets, eight were New Yorkers, their ages ranging from 21 to 56. The ninth was a 35-year-old woman from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. They were taken to hospital, where officials said that their wounds were not life-threatening. Six of the nine had been treated and released by that same night. Jeff Johnson's handgun, which held eight rounds, still had two rounds remaining when he was shot. And extra ammunition was also found inside his briefcase. At a news conference shortly after the shootings, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Police Commissioner Ray Kelly said that it appeared that police might have accidentally shot civilians during the incident. The day following the shooting, the police commissioner confirmed that all of the bystanders that had been wounded had been done so as a result of police gunfire. The New York Police Department released a brief surveillance video of the shootout between Jeff Johnson and the police. The footage shows Jeff wearing a suit, holding a briefcase and raising his handgun at the officers, who then responded with gunfire. He is shown being struck by the police's bullets, dropping his briefcase and falling to the ground on his back. People sitting on a bench and walking nearby are shown immediately fleeing the scene. A second video was caught by an Australian tourist from street level, where officers are seen with weapons pointed at Johnson lying on his back, just after he was shot. The camera then pans to the nearby streets where bystanders were struck and to pedestrians trying to hide between buildings during the ensuing chaos. The police department's chief spokesman said one witness had told investigators that Jeff had fired at the two officers, but they stated that they didn't have any ballistics to support that. They stated that it was possible that the officers had shot him before he could return fire. The police blocked off streets around the Empire State Building for hours, disrupting traffic in one of Manhattan's busiest areas, but reopened them by late that afternoon. It was confirmed that Jeff Johnson bought his gun in 1991 in Sarasota, Florida, where he attended art school but he did not have a license to carry it in New York. A few hours later, one of the people who was wounded, a ticket seller for Grey Line Tours, emerged from hospital with his right arm in a sling, stating, the bullet came in and went out. I'm very lucky. He said that he had been shot by a police officer and he was asked how he felt about that, and he said, I guess, you know, stuff happens. After the shooting, Jeff's mother was interviewed, and she stated, I don't blame police in New York for shooting my son, because he killed somebody. 
but for me, he hasn't changed. He's still the kind-hearted, caring person who loved all kinds of animals, and I'm sure he loved us. You know, a mother always tries to look for the best in you. She also stated that she believed that Jeff turned and pointed the gun at the police to make sure that they would shoot him and that he would die. She said that she would never understand what drove her son to do what he did and she couldn't even imagine what Steve's family was feeling. As for Steve and his family, his father Francis said that he spoke with his son daily and that he had never mentioned any problems at work that he had with anyone. On the 28th of August, his memorial was held. Friends and relatives consoled each other and they streamed in and out of the funeral home. Friends and family remembered the 41-year-old as an avid athlete, a sharp dresser and a dedicated worker. A person that would literally take the shirt off his back and give it to someone in need. A witty, warm, kind-hearted man who lived with a passion for his nieces and nephews, his brothers and his sister, his mother and father, his New York sports teams and especially his long-time girlfriend. He was laid to rest after an emotional service at Our Lady of Sorrows Church. And the family said that what eased their agonizing grief since the shooting were the hundreds of messages and phone calls they received, especially the ones about how Steve helped people change their lives for the better, advised them and mentored them. During his funeral service, his best friend said, Steve worked with this man, who obviously had problems, but it wasn't Steve's fault and there was nothing that he could do about it. The priest also spoke about egocentricity during his eulogy, stating that in this world, people so often worry about themselves only. In a world that so often reflects on jealousy, malice, and envy. So that is where we will end the video for today. If you have gotten this far, thank you so much for clicking on this video. Please remember to leave your theories, your thoughts, and your opinions in the comment section down below. Please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. It's a free way that you can help me out. I really do appreciate your support so very much. So until next time, stay safe out there, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Bye!